All right. Um, well, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for sticking around for this talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, quantum relative entropy. And if you haven't heard of the word functors or categories, that's okay. I hope uh, that I'll try to relay the messages across without you knowing those words or quantum either. Actually, this doesn't work. <laughs> Sorry, just one minute. It would be working now, I think. Can you try it? Yes, okay, great. So um, every function that you know of loses information. If you have a die and you roll it, um, you have certain outcomes that could occur. And let's say you have a function that says, I only want to know whether that output was odd or even. You're going to lose information from that. And I'm going to conveniently redraw these functions instead of drawing them, you know, in this set theoretic way, I'm going to draw them as sort of like a, a projection map from something that looks kind of like a vibration. And the reason I'm going to do that um, is because it'll help us visualize uh, what we would like to do, which is we're going to try to make hypotheses. If we have a certain output, we want to make a hypothesis on what could have led to that output. And in this case, if we see the outcome odd, and we don't know, you know, all we know is, you know, what the original function is, we can at least deduce that our role had to be odd. So one, three, or five. And similarly for even. But we need more information if we want to try to guess what the probabilities of those outcomes actually were. If we have actual probabilities, let's say we don't know what these probabilities are. I just drew these die is slightly larger to indicate that they're more probable. Let's say this is a, you know, a, a, a loaded die. Um, then that induces certain probabilities on the outputs, odd or even. And I'm going to visualize this rather than drawing these examples with, you know, dye and things like that. I'm going to visualize them, uh, these elements as water droplets. And the size of the water droplet indicates, you know, the, like, the higher likelihood of that event occurring. And then this projection map, all you do is you add the water droplets together, you combine the water droplets, and then they increase in size. Um, and that's, that increase is exactly indicating that there's a probability preserving map. By the way, please ask questions during my talk if you feel that I didn't, um, if I confused you in any way. Um, so we can try to make a hypothesis based on the information that we know, which is not the probability on the top, but just the probability on the bottom and the function f. Let's say we do this experiment many times. We see how often odd and even occur. So we can try to make a hypothesis. And when we make a hypothesis, what we do is we associate a probability measure for each outcome, a probability distribution on the things that could have led to that outcome, not anywhere else. And that's formalized categorically by saying that we have a stochastic section. But hypotheses aren't always correct, as you saw in the pictures that some of the red blobs, um, yes. Sorry, can we get an addition once more because you're going to use them? Uh, you know, I, I think you'll get a lot out of me verbally speaking okay, okay. rather than following the notation, but, but um, the squiggly arrow, I think maybe this is why, I will denote stochastic maps as squiggly arrows and deterministic maps as straight arrows. Was that your question actually? Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. But we don't see the... Where? Uh, right. So that's why it's important to have annotations. I didn't draw a morphism here yet. Yeah, yeah, but you write the right H, uh, H. H is a H is a stochastic map. Yes. Um, so we can try to make a hypothesis, and that's a stochastic map that takes us from these outputs, odd even, to these roll of die, and then we take our probability measure on the base and we push it forward using the stochastic map by this formula. And this gives us two probability measures, and we want to be able to compare them. So, you know, one, one way of comparing them is to use the relative entropy. So the relative entropy has a formula, but if you haven't seen it before, that's fine. Just know it's a way to compare the two probability measures. But I really want to point out two important properties of the relative entropy, which are that it's always non-negative, and two, it's identically zero if and only if the two probability measures are equal to each other. Why is that important? Because if we're looking at a hypothesis, then that second condition, if it equals zero, guarantees that we have what's called an optimal hypothesis, which means we've reproduced that probability measure that we want on the total space, on this larger space. 
So we can make a category out of this uh, where the objects are finite probability spaces and morphisms are pairs. So we have this projection map that forgets, loses this information. And then we have a map in the opposite direction, which is this time stochastic, that makes a hypothesis. And I want to emphasize that we are not assuming in this category that our hypotheses are always optimal because we're going to look at many different hypotheses and then we want to analyze um, which, you know, how do we obtain this optimal one. So we can view relative entropy as a functor that takes such a pair um, and it spits out the relative entropy. Um, and again, sometimes I'll say, no, I'll write notation here. This is just saying, you know, we get a number. <laughs> when we plug in a morphism, we get a number. That's all that notation means. And it's a non-negative number, could be infinite, depending on the supports. Um, but it turns out that this is a unique functor. And I'll explain what functoriality means in some explicit cases. But that essentially just means if I have a successive process and I compute each of the respective relative entropies, then the relative entropy of the full process equals the sum of the two. That's really all that functoriality means here. But it turns out this is the unique functor that's convex linear in a certain sense that I will not make precise, lower semi-continuous in a sense that I will not make precise, um, and it vanishes on all optimal hypotheses. And this is true up to a non-negative constant. So this theorem was proved by, um, yeah, I think I wrote it up here, Baez and Fritz, um, not too long ago, I think 2015. Um, and so I'm interested in what happens if we can similarly characterize the relative entropy in the quantum setting. So as, as I've indicated here, classically, we have finite probability spaces. And in the quantum setting, we have algebras and states. So this is sort of like the analogy here. But just by looking at this picture, you can see that I'm kind of talking about the same thing, just in a different context. And this is what category theory buys you. Um, so just a little technical, but hopefully, you know, it's just to make things precise, A and B are finite dimensional C star algebras in this context. Um, then omega and C, the things that re uh, replace probability measures are states, uh, which are positive linear unital maps, but just know that these are non-commutative generalizations of probability measures. And F, which is a, uh, which comes from, you know, the idea of having a deterministic map, Determinism here is replaced by preserving the algebraic structure. So it's a unital star homomorphism. And Q, uh, which is think of, you think of as a stochastic map, is what's technically called a quantum channel or a completely positive unital map. And it satisfies a retract condition. Why is it a retract instead of a section from before? That's just because when you go from classical to the algebras, you're thinking about algebras of functions and when you do that, when you look at what happens to states on the left-hand side, and you look at what happens to functions on the right-hand side, things go in reverse. But anyway, even if those details um, were a little bit over your head, this nevertheless gives us a category, which I'm just going to call non-commutative in stat, um, just because it's a non-commutative generalization. So what is relative entropy in this context? I'm not going to give you the general definition. Um, but I'll give it in a special case when we have matrix algebras and when we have our states are represented by density matrices. And in that case, we can, um, if we have a hypothesis, just like a hypothesis in the classical setting took our probability measure and allowed us to construct a probability measure on the total space, the same thing happens here. If we have a, if we have a state C that we uh, have access to, let's say, um, and we apply our hypothesis Q, we can pull that state back to the left, and then we get a state, um, a new state on the left, which, is ne which need not equal omega, it's some other state with its own density matrix representation. And then we can define the relative entropy between that hypothesis, that guest state, together with the original one that we don't know, and that's given by some formula that's due to umagaki. And I should also mention a very big difference between the classical and the quantum setting is that optimal hypotheses don't always exist. And this is a very big surprise because classically we can clearly see we can put together these probabilities in such a way that they always exist. Quantum mechanically, they don't. Nevertheless, we can still define a quantum relative entropy functor, which takes these pairs 
and it gives us the relative entropy and it satisfies functoriality. It's convex linear. And it also vanishes if you do happen to have an optimal hypothesis. And I've at least proven this when the states um, are faithful, which just means that there is no measure zero occurring non-commutatively. Um, and uh, interestingly, kind of a surprise is that a non-commutative disintegration theorem uh, was used in my proof of this. So sorry, did you yes. say this is a, um, a property or its characterization? It's, yeah, <laughs> I would like it to be a characterization and I'll mention that at the end, but right now it's a property, but I think it will be a characterization plus continuity, like appropriate continuity constraints. Um, so rather than talking about that proof, again, because I'm hoping for a characterization, which is still in work, but um, I rather illustrate what does functoriality mean in two examples. So if you have matrix algebras, let's say, you know, you have Alice, Bob, I don't know, Claire, um, you have systems A, B, C that are represented by matrix algebras, each with their own dimension, D subscript letter, A, B, C. Um, and then I look at inclusions. So let's say Claire includes into the system that takes care of Bob and Claire, and then that system gets included into the full system. Let's say I have a state on that full system, and then I could restrict that state to these subalgebras by partial traces, and then I could construct certain hypotheses. So this is just a specific kind of a diagram that lives in this category. It's just one kind of pair of composable morphisms. And if I apply functoriality to this specific pair, I actually reproduce the chain rule for the quantum conditional entropy. So in particular, I can take these quantum, I can take non-commutative spaces to be commutative ones. So in that case, I would also reproduce the chain rule for classical conditional entropy. Uh, wait, you're playing to what? Ah, I see, because this is a pair of, so yeah, it looks a little bit strange, right? Because I'm not just writing object, one arrow, object, <laughs> next arrow. Um, it looks like I have pairs of objects. But remember, this whole thing is a one morphism in my category from this yeah, object yeah, to I this remember, one. Yes, but what is the functor that you're applying? I don't oh, relative entropy. Right, I'm applying the relative entropy functor. So, uh, yes. So, a pair of two morphisms is not an object, it is a morphism. Uh, yes, a pair of, yeah, it's funny, right? A pair of morphisms, one which is deterministic, one which is stochastic in the opposite direction, together combine to form a single morphism in this category, non commutative Finstat. Yeah, exactly. This example, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm bothered a bit because uh, I don't see how, how Leibniz root would. Uh, it's Leibniz root or the plane? Or what's the um, well, the it's, it is a calculation, but the fact that um, we have these hypotheses um, necessarily tells us that they're of a certain form. And well, I've chosen them to be of a certain form. I think that's my question. My question is, uh, uh, well, what's the entry of the functor here? It, it should be just a map wrap, and this map should be a collection of the two. And, and I don't see how this appears in, in, in the equality you get here. Or how. You, so you can think of the first term as the relative entropy functor applied to including Claire into the full tripartite system, and then composing the two hypotheses. That's on the left hand side. And then the right-hand side is what happens when I um, apply relative entropy to each of these objects. But some terms cancel, some terms necessarily cancel, but that's the rough idea of where, um, how this is reproduced. So this is how you get the entropy instead of the divergence. So there are some cancellations. There are some cancellations, yes. But roughly speaking, that's the correspondence. Another example of functoriality, um, actually, let's just take two. Let's just t take two algebras. One is in included into the other, and a trivial one. So this core, the trivial one corresponds to you can think of the, the unique probability measure on the one element set. <laughs> and um, and if I if I have this inclusion and I have a state on B, and then I have an expectation, but it's not just any expectation. It's an expectation that preserves a state. So like these two squiggly arrows on top actually compose to create. A state on B. So it, it allows us to pull back the state on the subalgebra using this map onto the larger one and it reproduces this state on top. So if we apply functoriality to this pair, we actually reproduce um, 
this equation. Um, and what is this equation? This is actually Petz's conditional expectation property, which is an important property um, in non-commutative and quantum statistics. And I'll just point out that if you are familiar with uh, monotonicity of the relative entropy, you'll notice that monotonicity is an inequality here with the rightmost term gone. And the reason this is important is because one could try to strengthen this um, inequality by including this extra term, which comes from like recovery, recoverability. And um, this is like a special case of that more general formula. So why, why am I interested in this? Um, I hopefully indicated some of those reasons. Um, and also, what am I hoping to do with this? Uh, well, first of all, I want to finalize the proof of functor reality without these faithfulness assumptions. It is quite technical what happens when supports don't line up. You get infinities in some places. You want to make sure that functor reality still respects that. Um, and then eventually, hopefully, characterize um, the relative entropy. And I believe a theorem of pets may help um, in this though um, a lot of details need to be checked for that. Um, and as I mentioned on the previous slide, it's possible that one could apply some of these ideas to try to strengthen certain inequalities um, in the quantum setting. And I should mention um, actually on the previous slide um, that if we have a recover recoverability map um, that's sometimes taken to be the PETS recovery map and this conditional expectation is not satisfied, um, that actually, that inequality fails in the quantum setting, and we have explicit counterexamples that illustrate why it fails and the importance of this expectation property that appropriately generalized. Um, and of course, one of the main motivations is to unify many different types of entropy. Um, can, can we realize all, of, all forms of entropy sort of like in this functorial manner? And I should mention Although I am short on time, I will mention some things about other approaches that have existed on different kinds of entropy. Um, I think this whole program initiated with the theorem of Baez, Fritz, and Leinster, who characterized the Shannon entropy difference. Um, and then this was generalized to the quantum setting uh, by myself and Konstantin Doring independently um, through this, um, through a same, through essentially like a, the similar viewpoint. Um, another viewpoint. Uh, generalize this to the conditional entropy, um, though one would like to also do this for the quantum conditional entropy. And of course, relative entropy was the subject of this talk and was initiated by Baez and Fritz, continued by um, Gagne and Panangaren, who extended it to the inf uh, infinite dimensional setting. And this work is still in progress. And of course, I should also mention, um, as um, Juan Pablo was talking about, there's also homological functorial characterizations due to Valdor and Banacan and himself. There's operational, um, operational uh, viewpoints as well, inequality constraints by others that characterize relative entropy. And of course, one would like to know, you know, there's a lot of theorems characterizing all of these different kinds of information measures. Uh, what's really this unifying picture that puts everything together? How can we understand all of these different types? And how do we organize them? And in some sense, the, the, the viewpoint um, by Audon and Benacan and Vigneault seems to be like a pretty good approach, in, in my opinion. Um, so that's actually all that I have to say. Um, thank you for your time. And here are some of the references. The first one's on von Neumann entropy. Second one is about this talk. And this last one is the new result on classical conditional um, uh, entropy from a categorical perspective. Thank you. Yes. So uh, I have a question because I you know Bias uh, knows a great deal of quantum theory. And uh, so you are certainly aware that the states are very rare for certain A and Bs, right? I mean, if you take quantum, for example, the Allen uh deformation of the tori, the quantum groups deformation. There'll be, there'll be not very many states, you see. That's, so my question is, what do you do when you don't have many states? I mean, I'm not really sure if this addresses it, but I'm working in the context of C-star algebras. And there yeah, are, indeed, I'm talking about that. Yes. There are many states. There are many states? Well, it depends. depends. Well, again, yeah, I'm also... on the C-star, of course. Yes, of course. But in this case, I'm also working with finite dimensional systems. Maybe oh. that might be why 
Um, I mean, that answers one could very special ones, but one could also extend a lot of these ideas to the infinite dimensional setting. No, no, but, but that uh, no, because I yeah, no, I see. Very different. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah.